All right, Hotep, how's everybody doing? Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. So I'm out of town right now. I'm in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Got in uh, earlier today. Got in this morning, actually. And uh, I was reading articles, uh, checking my email, because I get uh, email updates from news outlets all throughout the day. So I saw this interesting article from the Washington Post, written by Jonathan Capehart for the Washington Post. And it was picked up by um, thegrio.com also, and other news outlets have it as well. So Jonathan Capehart, who writes for the New York Post, I mean, uh, writes for the Washington Post, opinion column for the Washington Post, he has a podcast called uh, Cape Up, okay? His last name is Cape Hart. Um, so he has a podcast called Cape Up. And on his, his latest podcast, he interviewed uh, jazz great Wynton Marsalis. Wynton Marsalis, okay? And uh, Wynton Marsalis talked about, uh, he was asked about hip hop and hip hop today, things like this. And he talked about how rap and hip hop are more damaging than the statue of General Robert E. Lee. Okay. So I listened to the entire podcast. The entire podcast is about 58 minutes. I listened to the entire podcast. I read the article from the Washington Post. Also read the article from uh, the griot.com. The griot has a really good uh, shorter synopsis um, of the of the interview and of the article, especially dealing with this, especially dealing with this topic here. Okay. So I want to talk about this um, because uh, Winston, Winston Marsalis, uh, he made some really good points. Okay. He's not against removing the Confederate statue uh, or Confederate statues. He talked about how he was involved with Mayor uh, Mitch uh, Landrieu uh, to remove uh, a Confederate statue of General Robert E. Lee in New Orleans. Okay. But what he was saying was that um, uh, he talked about the negative impact of hip hop. Okay, so we're going to jump into uh, we're going to jump into this. How's everybody doing? Share this bro broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Okay, and just give me a minute here. Let me post the uh, let me post the information here also. All right. Since I'm not in the office. And I'm broadcasting from my phone. This is a little different than normal. Okay. Here we go. All right, yeah, so share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in as well. So you've heard me talk about the negative impact of negative corporate hip-hop, okay? And Wynton Marsalis, uh, he acknowledged that all hip-hop is not bad. He said that, okay? So I, I, I really encourage people to read the... Uh, I really encourage people to read the uh, interview that uh, that Jonathan Capehart did with him. Okay, all right. So if we look at uh, if we look at the article from the griot.com entitled "Winton Marsalis Rap More Damaging Than Statue of General Robert E. Lee or, or Statue of Confederate Lee," he said uh, it says the legendary jazz performer feels that misogyny in hip hop has done more damage than the statues of a Civil War commander who defended white supremacy, okay? So General Robert E. Lee was a former slave owner. He was the general of the Confederate Army during the Civil War, okay? He took up arms to fight on behalf of the of Virginia. He, uh, uh, he was from the state of Virginia, but he took up arms to fight against the Union to keep slavery intact. He was a brutal slave owner, okay? Uh, now, if you remember back to August 12th of 2017, when in Charlottesville, Virginia, you had the uh, what was called the Unite the Right rally, the Unite the Right rally. And you had 12 white supremacist groups, organizations that came together and they had this Unite the Right rally and they were trying to save a Confederate monument, a uh, Confederate statue gen uh, dedicated to General Robert E. Lee. Right. And that's when you had this one crazy guy who drove a car into a group of protesters and it killed 
Heather Hare, who was a white female who was a protester, right? That was the Unite the Right rally. Well, they were trying to preserve a, a statue of General Robert E. Lee, okay? And this is who uh, Winter Marsalis was talking about. But what a lot of people don't know is that, number one, General Robert E. Lee was against erecting Confederate monuments after the Civil War was over with, okay? He felt that uh, there needed to be a time of healing. He felt that erecting Confederate monuments would continue to keep the wounds open. So he was against erecting Confederate monuments after the Civil War was over with. And he was against using the Confederate flags and the Confederate battle flags after the Civil War was over with as well. All right. So now what's really interesting is that you had these white supremacist groups who had this Unite the Right rally. OK. But uh, they were in Charlottesville, Virginia. Who was Charlottesville, Virginia named after? It was named after Queen Sophia Charlotte. Queen Sophia Charlotte, who was of African descent, wife of King George III. She was the queen of Great Britain. So most of these white supremacists don't even know that the city that you held your, little, your white supremacist rally in was named after an African woman. So jazz, jazz legend Wynton Marsalis took the gloves off in an interview with the Washington Post when he criticized rap music saying, uh, saying often misogynistic lyrics in the songs are more damaging than a statue a Confederate, uh, of a Confederate general who led the South during the Civil War. He said, quote, my words are not that powerful. I started saying in 1985, I don't think we should have music talking about N words and B's and H's. OK, B's and holes. OK, he said he said it had no impact. I've said it. I repeated it. I still repeat it. To me, that's more damaging than the statue of Robert E. Lee. OK, and he was interviewed by Jonathan Capar. K part for the Cape Up podcast. Now, Winston Marsalis in this podcast, it was a really, really good podcast. I encourage people to listen to it, okay? We're going to post the link of this article here from the griot.com here on the thread, okay? Because I went through and listened to the um, uh, entire interview. And I listened to it really twice, actually. I went through and listened to the entire interview, okay? So, Winston Marsalis talked about in the interview, he talked about how. He helped New Orleans man, uh, uh, mayor, Mayor Mitch Landrew, to remove the General Robert E. Lee statue in 2017. But, but he feels that negative lyrics in hip hop are more damaging to African Americans than the Confederate, Confederate statues. He's all for removing the Confederate statues he talked about. He said, basically, no, don't get me wrong. He's for removing the Confederate statues, but he thinks that negative lyrics in hip hop are much more uh, damaging. So you don't see a nationwide fight to clean up the lyrics in negative hip hop. So you see, we saw nationwide, we saw pressure being put on various cities to remove the Confederate monuments as they should because the Confederate monuments were largely erected to um, terrorize African Americans and, and to keep us in a low servile place in society. If you understand the history of the Confederate monuments, the majority of them were not erected after slavery ends, which ends in uh, 1865. Um, the two biggest periods of time that you have the most Confederate monuments erected are 1895 to 1915 and uh, 1955 to 1970. Well, 1955 to 1970 is the Civil Rights Movement. They were erected in opposition to the Civil Rights Movement, especially right after Brown versus Board of Education desegregation case. After that court ruling, that ruling came out May 17th, uh, 1954. And right after that, you're going to see a lot of schools that change their names to schools named after Confederate heroes and Confederate leaders. You're going to have a, a, a lot of Confederate monuments that are that are erected uh between that period of time, 1955 to 1970, and they were erected in opposition to the civil rights movement to terrorize African Americans and to keep us in a low place in society. Then you're going to have a huge amount that were built from 1895 to 1915. Okay, so 1895 was the year before Plessy versus Ferguson, um, uh, U.S. Supreme Court case 
which legalized Jim Crow laws, okay? And it was Brown versus Board of Education that basically overturned Ple Plessy versus Ferguson, okay? And then, uh, so 1895 to 1915. So 1915 is the second year of World War I. And then 1915 is also the year that the uh, movie The Birth of, Birth of a Nation comes out, which rejuvenates and revitalizes the Ku Klux Klan. And then 1915 is also the 50th year anniversary of the ending of the Civil War and the freeing of the enslaved Africans, which was in 1865. Okay, so these are the two periods of times that you have the largest amount of these Confederate monuments erected. So um, he said, uh, so went to Marsala and said, I feel uh, that that's much more of a racial issue than taking Robert E. Lee's statue down. Okay, he said there's more N words in that than there are in Robert E. Lee's statue. He's saying there's more N words in negative hip hop than there are in Robert E. Lee's statue. And the the music is more widespread. The music has a bigger impact on us than the statues does. He says you hear the music over and over and over again. You see, you see the um, top hip hop stations in the in the city. They have virtually the same ten songs in heavy rotation each hour. Okay. Now Robert E. Lee, General Robert E. Lee, commanded the Confederate Army during the Civil War until he surrendered to the Union Army in 1865, ending the four-year conflict. Statues dedicated to General Robert E. Lee have dotted uh, the South, but many have recently been taken down. Now, what we should ask ourselves is that um, if there were only 11 states in the Confederacy, if there were only 11 states in the Confederate States of America, then why did you have Confederate monuments in... Um, 31 states in the in the Union. 31 states in the U.S. have Confederate monuments. There were only 11 states in the Confederacy. Okay, so this all go this all deals with uh, terrorizing uh, African Americans. This is what this is about. Okay, all right. We'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute. All right. So let's continue here. All right, so although uh, Wynton Marsalis has produced conscious music, like his 1997 um, album, Blood on the Fields, that reflected on slavery and his Grammy Award-winning Black Codes from the Underground, Black Codes from the Underground, Wynton Marsalis sees hip-hop as a bigger threat to the minds of black people than past transgressions, reports the Washington Post, Okay. And when he's talking about the past trans transgressions, he's really talking about the fair monuments. But he talked about minstrel shows, okay? He talked about minstrel shows. He said, it's like just, he said, it's just like the toll the minstrel show took on black folks and on white folks. Now all this N-word this and B-word that and hold this, he said, that's just, a, he said, that's just a fact at this point. OK, so he's talking about how widespread the minstrel shows were and the damage that minstrel shows did. So if you look at the history of the minstrel shows, they start about 1828, to 1829 in the South. You have a uh, a white male entertainer named T.D. Rice, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, T.D. Rice, W.R.I.C.E. And according to the story. According to the legend, he sees an enslaved African male, either teenage, teenage male or young adult male, whatever, uh, 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 older male, maybe, maybe in his 20s. And he sees him tending to some animals, okay, horses. And he's singing a song, turn around, jump around, I jump just so. Every time I turn around, I jump Jim Crow, okay? That's how the song went. So then what T.D. Rice does is he puts on tattered, torn clothing. He puts on blackface. He adopts a southern dialect imitating enslaved Africans. This is 1828, 1829, right? This is during, still during slavery. This is even before the Underground Railroad is created because the Underground Railroad doesn't start till about 1831, okay? And he performs on stage 
imitating and mocking African Americans, especially enslaved African Americans. Well, this becomes a big hit. The minstrel shows become one of the top forms of entertainment in the country. I mean, this is before really radio. Okay, you're talking about 18, 20, 18, early 1830s. Okay, and one of the things that the minstrel shows did was all the negative stereotypes, all the negative stereotypes of African Americans you saw depicted in the minstrel shows. They also tended to depict us as being childlike mentally, being childlike and being servile and obedient. Okay. So, Winter Marsalis went on to say, for me, it was not a default position in the 1980s. Now, I said, now that, now that it is the default position, how you like me now? He said, you like, he said, you like what it's yielding. Something is wrong with you. You need your head examined. OK, if you like this. So he talked about in the 80s when he when he talked about negative hip hop and then even into the 90s, what have you, how he would get beat up about it. OK, but he's telling the truth. All right. And, and, and he and he I encourage people once again to listen to the interview because he said he, he's not talking about all hip hop. We understand some hip hop is positive, but he's talking about the commercialized hip hop. That you hear the, the majority of it is negative and destructive. Now, when he was asked about the Kanye West controversy, Kanye West comments about slavery, and he said, "Y'all, y'all were there for four hundred years. It was all y'all." And uh, uh, you know, he said that sounds like a choice. And I dealt with that. Go, go back and watch my two videos dealing with Kanye West because he's totally clueless about the history of slavery. Totally clues about the history of slavery. Okay, and he did not even talk about the uh, um, how even Africans on the continent of Africa fought against the transatlantic slave trade as well. So uh, Winston Marsalis said his words shouldn't be taken to heart. Uh, referring to Kanye West, Kanye West's words should not be taken to heart since he does not have intellectual authority like someone with prominence. He said, speaking of Kanye West, he said, I would not give seriousness to what he said in that way. OK, the guy's making products. Uh, he said, it's not like Martin Luther King said it, a person who knows or is conscious of a certain thing. He said he's entitled to whatever it is he wants to say. The quality of his thought is in the product he makes. OK, well, I, I have to disagree with him. So she um, Kanye has 28.5 million followers on his Twitter page. He has 28.5 million followers on his Twitter page. A lot of our youth listen to him. They won't listen to Dr. King. Most adults don't even understand Dr. King. I hear people on radio shows talking about Dr. King, things like this. Most people have never read any of Dr. King's books that he wrote. Most of us don't even know that Dr. King wrote books. And Dr. King was a lot more similar and a lot closer to Malcolm, to Malcolm X than people even think or people even know because they haven't studied Malcolm X either. And, and, and our children are, are clueless about uh, both of them. Be beyond that, I have a dream speech. And that wasn't even the original name of the speech. The original name of the speech was called a council check. The speech that Dr. King delivered August 28, 1963, that speech was not called I Have a Dream. It was renamed that by the media. That's not what that speech was called. Okay, so, um, and the speech was about holding America accountable for a promissory note that America gave African Americans in 1863. He's talking about the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863. And he said, when we went to go cash that check, it was marked insufficient funds. OK, and he was talking about holding America accountable for its promise. And he was talking about economics. This is what the speech was about. All right. OK, so a lot of our youth listen to Conway. He's very influential for a lot of our youth. And his comments were just totally wrong. Shows a total lack of understanding of history. Go back and watch the two broadcasts. I did them with that because I don't have time to get into that now. OK. But what, what, what Winston Marsalis is saying 
he's really, really correct. Because you've heard me talk before about negative, destructive hip hop. You saw the interview that I did. Uh, we actually did two with uh, I actually did two with Herb Alchemist, and we talked about Cardi B and the beef between Cardi B and Azalea Banks. We talked about the negative corporate hip hop, the influence that the the negative hip hop has on our daughters as well. Okay, extremely, extremely important. Um, the article from the Washington Post is a more extensive article. And uh, Jonathan Capehart wrote, wrote this article from the Washington Post. It's entitled, Jazz Musician Winter Marsalis Says Rap and Hip Hop Are More Damaging Than a Statue of Robert E. Lee. Okay, so we'll post the link here as well. And once again, he's all for removing the statues of the Confederate soldiers and the Confederate generals. Okay, but... Um, Negative hip hop is more wise. It is more damaging. Yes, it is. A number of reasons. One, you hear it on the radio over and over again. It seeps into your subconscious. It, it influences the way you think, feel, act, and behave. Two, when you see the music videos, they don't have music videos promoting Confederate monuments, but you have music videos that promote alcohol consumption, drug usage, promiscuity, violence, death. Um, uh, Negative, degenerating, uh, degenerative language uh, and terminology for African Americans. Okay, so it's a much, much bigger. It's a much, much bigger threat. Uh, so he's absolutely correct. Uh, so let me see. Let me look at the uh, article here from uh, the um, it, Washington Post. So in the interview, I learned a lot about Winter Marsalis in the interview as well because he talked about some of his uh, earlier works. And how they were thought provoking, and there was a consciousness to them. They were tied to African American history. So, Winter Marsalis was the first jazz musician to win the Pulitzer Prize for music in 1997 with Bloods on the Fields, Bloods on the Fields, which was a vocal and or, or, uh, orchestral uh, rumination on slavery. A vocal and orchestral rumination on slavery. It came 12 years after the release of Black Codes from the Underground which won two Grammy Awards in 1986 and 10 years and 10 years before from the plantation to the penitentiary. He has another another album called From the Plantation to the Penitentiary. So when you so when you listen to the names of these albums he has, they're tied into slavery. They're tied into our history. Blood on the fields. Blood on the fields, like on the cotton fields, the tobacco plantations, things like this. The black coat black codes from the underground. What were the black codes? The black codes were the laws that the South put in place after slavery ends to regulate the movements of African Americans and to re-enslave us it, it, for, for uh, uh, civil infractions, okay, for minor infractions, to criminalize us for that. Th those are the black codes. Then he, then he, he has um, uh, 1986, uh, it, well, he, had, he, uh, it's, he he won two Grammy Awards in 1986 and 10 years. And then um, he, he also had an album called From the Plantation to the Penitentiary. From the Plantation to the Penitentiary. So Wynton Marsalis will add to his collection of commissions that blend his fluency in jazz and matters of race with the debut of the Ever funky down uh, uh, the ever funky lowdown the ever funky lowdown on June seventh. That's his new CD that's coming out. The ever funky lowdown. Okay. Uh, actor Wendell Pierce, another New Orleans native, will serve as narrator. Uh, if you're not in New York, you can watch the premiere via live uh, via a free live webcast. Okay, they have a link in here for that also. All right. So. Um, let me see here. He commented on Childish Gambino as well. Okay. Uh, so he was asked. Well, went to Marsalis explain how the ever funky lowdown also manifests itself in the consumption of damaging mythology about African-Americans, the consumption of damaging mythology about African-Americans. He said it plays on how you think, what you think, the mythology you're given. You're given this mythology. All these movies and show and TV shows, black people commit crimes. Black people call each other the N-word. Black people call each other bees and things like this. 
black people all this. He said everybody lives in, in drug infested communities. Everybody, everybody shoots this. They don't have any respect. Every black person has no integrity. You could have a movie with no black people in it. The one black person in the movie would be the one with no integrity. That's just the mythology. So if I'll get you to buy into that, okay, that's the ever funky lowdown. Okay. So he's talking about the lies, the propaganda of the white controlled media. He's talking about the lies that are projected towards us. And one of the things that you're going to find is that oftentimes many of our TV shows, right? Many of, many of those negative TV shows, they're going to have more vulgarity in them also. One example is the TV show Empire. There's a lot more vulgarity in the language that's used for our TV shows, which demeans us. It puts us into a negative category. Another TV show like that with the vulgar language was um, the TV show Survivor's Remorse on uh, Star. Survivor's Remorse, that's another one. Had a lot of vulgar language. And this gets associated with African Americans, which then is associated with characteristic traits, character traits of us, which then justifies the over-policing, justifies the criminalization, okay? All right, so this is this is a really really good, uh, uh, really interesting article. I mean, an interesting interview um, with Winter Marsalis today. Um, and the other thing he talked about was um, the projection that um, uh, of black on black crime. Okay, the the myth of black on black crime. And he talked about, and, and I've talked about this before. He talked about how you kill where you live. So Chinese people kill Chinese people, white people kill white people. You kill where you live, okay? Uh, and we know that, you know, the media loves to talk about black on black crime. So we know 89% of African Americans who are killed are killed by other African Americans. But 83% of white people who are killed are killed by other white people. So white on white crime is not talked about. This was something created by the media back in about back in the 1980s. But I think it was about back about the 1980s, the whole black on black crime myth. Okay, lit probably about late 80s, all right? Um, let's see, okay. So let's look at some of your comments here. Uh, Melvin said earlier, I asked um, a question regarding uh, Winter Marsalis. Let me see if I can see any of your questions here. Okay, he said earlier I asked a question about uh, Winter Marsala's statement. If our people were educated by the Europeans here in, in America, who then taught us to speak negative of our people when those same people... Uh, Okay, who taught us when those same people negatively influence our people through education, business, and entertainment? Okay. Um, Willie said, in terms of in terms of rap being more dangerous than Confederate statues, I think the detriment is one and the same because of the perpetual influences uh, in and white and white supremacists as well as the continual negativity among our people. Well negative hip hop is, is much more damaging than uh prophetic monuments. I'm all for the Confederate monuments coming down, but a lot of people don't even know what the Confederate monuments represent. I'm all for them coming down because they honor traitors to the Union. They should have never been erected and they were erected to uh, terrorize African Americans at the period of time they were erected. But if you if you look at people, you see them walking around with their smartphones and earbuds in and listening to hip hop. It influences their, their conscious level. It influences the words that they use, the jargon they use. OK, it, it, you, you should, we should ask ourselves this question. Why is it that it's it's largely our music 
that has more profanity in it, more vulgarities in it, dehumanizing degenerative language. What impact does it have on you? If we go back, let's look at this. If we go back to the 1960s and we in the 50, late 50s and 1960s and we have, you know, like the Motown sound, we have music that was uplifting music, okay? The music, when you listen to the Motown music, the music made you want to love. You listen to the Temptations, you listen to the Supremes, the Four Tops, things like this, okay? You know, Baby Love and and um, just my imagination and, uh, you know, all, all the hits from, from, from the Temptations, my... Uh, uh, um, my girl and, and different things like this. So it made you want to love, okay? Now, the question you should ask yourself, all right? Um, the question you should ask yourself is what does killing N-word music make you want to do? See, if the, if, the, if the music from the 60s, the Motown sound, the 70s, the Philadelphia sound, Gamble and Huff, all this, all types of things like this. You know, if that music made you want to love, you listen to Marvin Gaye. I mean, listen to Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. Okay, Marvin. I mean, this is. I mean, I mean these. I mean that type of music just elevated your your conscious level. If you were having a bad day, you know that music makes you makes you want to feel good. So look at what that type of music did. And how it, it and how it resonated with you, how it vibrate, how the vibrations from it, right? And then ask yourself, what does killer N word music make you want to do? How does that impact you? One of the things that Winston, Winston Marsalis talked about, and I couldn't find it in the article from the Washington Post, but in the interview, because like I said, I listened to the interview twice. He talked about the importance of the drum in music. For, especially for African Americans, the importance of the drum in music and how the drum has been taken out of the music and replaced with the synthesizer. And he talked about how the drum was essential and it was it was the it was like the rhythms and, and how the drum hits you, how the beats hit you. He said is um, he gave the example that um, when you hear your mother speaks, when you hear your mother speak. Your mother, the way when you hear your mother speak, it, it hits you, it does something to you. It's not the words that she speaks, it's just the sound. It's the sound, it's the vibrations. It's the same thing with the drum. Okay? It's the same thing with the drum. Okay? So it's the it's the sound, it's the vibrations of the drum as it hits you. Okay? So when that's taken out. And replaced in the live in the live music, the live drama is taken out and replaced with a synthesizer. Okay, the effect is not the same. All right, so uh, Melvin said because those songs were pushed by our people, Motown owned and ran by Barry Gordy, Interscope owned by European Corporation. Ron Lewis and Program Share. Yeah, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. Okay. And then also, if you, uh, okay, we'll post the article here from the Washington Post. So, um, we're, we're going to continue here with some of your comments here in just a minute. Hey, guys, if you like this type of information, a couple things you can do. Uh, one, be sure to register for the online courses that I teach. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have a bundle pack of the courses right now. They're on sale. Um, uh, Fifty-five percent off. Is, uh, they're on sale. Sixty dollars regularly. One hundred thirty dollars. It's a ten-course bundle pack. It includes understanding the transatlantic slave trade. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade. What they didn't teach you in school. That is a um, seven-session, fourteen-hour online course. All these courses are on demand. Watch at your own pace. We have the bundle pack, so register for that. We just posted that. So Paul Keith Grant said, this younger generation has not been taught by, their, by the parents. They do uh, a disservice by not passing down history. Uh, okay, yeah, and I agree with that. Check out the article that I posted today as well, and look at some of the comments. I posted an article a few hours ago, because I just published this article. It deals with the royal wedding. Now, some of you all saw my Facebook live broadcast dealing with the royal wedding, right? 
and I talked about how um, uh, black people watched the uh, royal wedding but forgot about British involvement in slavery. Black people watched the royal wedding but, but, but forgot about British involvement in slavery. Uh, and then I published an article today dealing with that and it has the, uh, the new video that I uploaded as well of me talking about that, so check this out. But if you look at the post here on our, our Facebook page, if you, if you look at the post that I did of that article, read some of the comments, you can tell a big difference from the comments of, of our people who really don't understand history, don't understand the transatlantic slave trade, don't understand the British involvement, and those that do. You can tell a big difference in the type of comments that they left, all right? Uh, Ron Lewis said the rhythm, uh, the rhythm that beat allows us to meditate. You can go in and out of meditation very easily. Okay, yeah, that rhythm, that beat is extremely important coming from a live drum. All right, uh, Maxine said, I feel uh, that the negative rap was produced to help fill the prisons with young black men. Well, so what happened was positive conscious hip hop got too powerful for Europeans in control. And they made, they made a concerted effort to... Uh, take control of it, take control of it, and send it in another direction, because conscious hip hop was elevating our conscious level. It was causing us to develop a political awareness. It was causing us to develop a global political awareness. Many of us got involved in the anti-apartheid movement, uh, dealing with South Africa. Uh, uh, you had a lot of African American students in college who were listening to conscious hip hop, uh, and then this spurred. Uh, numerous sit-ins across the country back in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s. African-American students were having sit-ins on campuses across the country demanding an Africana Studies Department. Demanding an Africana Studies Department at, the, at their schools. And they were, fueled, they were fueled by conscious hip-hop. Okay? Public Enemy. Okay? X-Clan. Pro righteous teachers, brand newbians, brand newbian, all different things, all different things like this, right? They were fueled by this. It was, it was, you know, your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. And this, we were using this as a, as a, as a weapon. We were using this as a weapon to fight back. And this was co-opted by corporate conglomerates sent in a, in a different direction. So then you had the gangster rap that began, that became elevated, that really pushed to the wayside of uh, the conscious hip hop artists. Okay, uh, you had the misogynistic, you had the more misogynistic rap. You're gonna have the Luther Campbells and things like this that are gonna rise and really push to the side. Yes, you're going to have, uh, I know Professor Griff talks about how, uh, if I remember correctly, he said, you know, they went on tour or they performed at the show, you know, and they were on the same uh, bill as the two live crew, right? But what happens is, is that those other, those conscious hip hop acts, their contracts are not renewed with the um, record companies. Oftentimes, they get pushed to the side. More money's put into the gangster rappers. More money's put into that, and then it just changes the landscape. Okay? Um, Adrian said, insert, NW, insert NWA gangster rap and two live crew misogynistic rap. Absolutely, you're gonna have this, and I and I and I know NWA they were they were fighting back, and they were talking about police brutality and things like this, but they were also talking about some other negative things as well. Okay, uh, Ron said why, uh, white people uh, could take a group called X Clan uh, could not take a group called X Clan because it went against their white nationalist agenda. Some white people, yeah, you I mean you had some white kids in college who liked the X Clan, but others. You others did not. Um, black people don't support conscious hip hop. Uh, that's what Bilal said. Some of them don't, but even today you have. I mean, even today, Arrested Development has a, still a big following. I know speech from Arrested Development. Even today, they, they still have a you know a a, a really good following. Uh, Philip said, uh, "There's an 
intro part to fight the power which is never shown that has Chuck D denounced in the March on Washington as a bunch of nonsense and mention uh, to the detriments of integration. Okay, that's interesting. The real fight was not integration. The real fight was for desegregation. If you actually really study the civil rights movement, get beyond like the snippets, get beyond the slogans, if you actually really study the civil rights movement, you know that the real fight was for desegregation not integration. And at the same time, uh, Malcolm X, when he leaves the Nation of Islam, Malcolm gets involved in the civil rights movement. It helps radicalize the civil rights movement. Not only that, July 31st, 1963, the month before the March on Washington, Malcolm X sends a letter to Dr. King and the other uh, major civil rights leaders asking for a meeting because Malcolm said there needed to be a unification of the civil rights leaders, okay? And he said that if Nikita Khrushchev and, and President John ah! he said if Nikita Khrushchev and President John F. Kennedy can uh meet, okay, if they can meet and put aside their differences, okay, he said to put aside their large differences, then he said uh then uh African American civil rights leaders should be able to meet and put aside their minor differences, okay? And uh, he called for a unification of, of the leaders. Uh, now, nobody, um, I don't think anybody had, uh, came to the meeting. There was a rally that was going to be held also, but nobody um, attended that. But the, but the month later was the March on Washington, okay? So I think that maybe had something to do with it. But keep in mind that in... Um, a, a few months before Dr. King is assassinated, uh, Dr. King meets with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Just a few months before he's assassinated. So uh, Dr. King in 67 and 68 would have definitely met with the Malcolm X and Malcolm has still been, still been alive. Okay. All right. Okay. Freddie said the dumbing down of our culture through selling lies the dumbing down of our culture through selling lies. Sandy said uh, that integration and at the same time uh, when he leaves, but the white man has been fighting an economic game against black people, the reason for slavery of the past and incarceration of the present. Melvin said x Clan was and still is heavy, a heavy influence in my life, not to say I didn't listen to gangster rap. Yeah, well, you know, I, I uh, actually interviewed ISIS from the X Clan uh, some years ago, and uh, I interviewed uh, Brother Jay from the X, X Clan also. Okay, so they are uh, the X Clan was bad, man. I, I, on, um, on TV One, they do unsung on different music acts. I want them to do an unsung on uh, the X Clan. Okay. I want them to do an unsung on the X-Clan. All right. So, hey, if you like this type of information and uh, you want to support the African History Network, you can donate to the African History Network. Uh, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay, that helps out a lot. Donate $5, 10 15 50 $100. That helps out a lot. It helps us to keep doing the research, pay the bills, stay on the pay the bills, stay on the air. Um, and you can also go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on the yellow donate button as well. Okay, but that's PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. We just posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast. All right. So um, once again, I really encourage you to listen to that interview that uh, Jonathan Capehart did with Winston Mar Winter Marsalis. Man, it was really good. I learned a lot about Winter Marsalis, learned, learned uh, more about jazz, um, and his comments were really good. His comments about Kanye West, comments about Childish Gambino also. Uh, if we look at the article from the Washington Post, uh, he, he commented about uh, uh, Childish Gambino uh, as well. He was asked about that. Um, let me see here. He said, um, let's see. 
Okay, so he was talking about the Ever Funky Lowdown, which is his new project coming out in the mythology. And after hearing Wynton Marsalis say that, I couldn't help but ask him what he thought of This Is America uh, from Childish Gambino, okay? Uh, Donald Glover, Childish Gambino. He said, I applaud his creativity and what he's doing, okay? Uh, he said, uh, from a social standpoint, it has to decry a thing that you depict that's di that's difficult okay um and then that's when he asked him about um kanye west all right okay let's get some more of your comments here and we're gonna get out of here um he said okay who said that daryl said i totally agree with everything he says Freddie said, my homeboy, uh, Devon Boatwright, is a positive hip-hop artist named Dev Boat. Check him out on YouTube. All right. Check out Dev Boat on YouTube, B-O-A-T. Um, Bilal said, uh, PlayStation costs more than a chopper. All right. Okay, once again, also, guys, remember, uh, okay, uh, those in Detroit, African Liberation Day is coming up. Uh, and, you know, around the country, um, African Americans celebrate African Liberation Day. It's May 25th. Uh, this weekend, there'll be African Liberation Day uh, events in Detroit, Friday, May 25th, Saturday, May 26th. It's taking place at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. The Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Okay, we have to get the art. We have to get the um, flyer up at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I'll get that up. Dr. Ray Winbush will be the uh, uh, keynote speaker this year, Friday, uh, February twenty fifth, six p.m. to nine p.m. Saturday, uh, February twenty sixth. I think it probably starts at about eleven eleven a.m. to six p.m. It's a free event. I speak on Saturday at three thirty p.m. I'm doing a workshop dealing with the film Black Panther. Black Panther analysis, African culture, history, and Afrofuturism, all right? Be sure to register for the online courses that I teach. We have a bundle pack. They're all on demand. You can uh, watch at your own pace. You can watch from around the world. Uh, it's a 10 course bundle pack. It includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. We do a thousands of years of history. We deal with, you talk some about the Civil War, but thousands of years of history. We deal with the African presence in this country uh, going back at least 51,700 years. We deal with ancient Egypt. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. It sets up, which uh, brings Europe out of the Dark Ages. That sets up the transatlantic slave trade to take place. And it sets up Christopher Columbus to set sail on his four voyages starting August, August 3rd, 1492 when he set sail on Nina de Penta and Santa Maria, okay? Those in the uh, Newark, New Jersey area, because I'm in Newark, New Jersey now, I'm here for a few days. Those in the Newark, New Jersey area, hey, if, um, if there are any events going on uh, here in the area, let me know. Uh, you can inbox me here on Facebook, or uh, you can also email me at info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, if you uh, uh, if you want me to speak at any of your, any of your events while I'm here in Newark, let me know that as well. Okay. All right. Okay. Freddie said, "Any seminars in the Bay Area? Not that I know of. If you yeah, if you are on, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, email me also info info at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay." Um, and then also, let's see here. So this Sunday, um, I won't be on live. Well, this Sunday we won't broadcast uh, from nine from the radio stations and uh, radio station at nine ten a.m. the super station because um, of the Memorial Day holiday. I got the email today that the station's closed. So uh, I'll probably broadcast here on Facebook Live Sunday night. We'll probably broadcast here on Facebook Live. Okay. Uh, also, we have the 8-DVD Black Panther Bundle Pack. The 8-DVD Black Panther Bundle Pack. Uh, it's on sale right now, $80, regularly $130. You get uh, five of my DVD lectures, including two of my presentations, dealing with the film Black Panther. And then um, you get uh, three documentaries, the 1804 documentary, dealing with the history of the Haitian Revolution. 
uh, Elementary Genocide Part 3 and Black Friday Part 2. I'm in both of those documentaries, okay? So that's on sale right now. Uh, the black, the 8 DVD Black Panther Bundle Pack on sale $80. It's a huge, it's a great, great deal. And uh, it's also available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well, okay? Freddie said, thanks again, sir. All right. And uh, we appreciate those that support the African History Network. If you want to support and continue to support, um, purchasing the DVD lectures helps. And then also if you want to donate, that helps as well. Okay. We'll post a link again because it takes a lot to do this. And uh, usually when I travel, I'm paying out of pocket as well. Because uh, a lot of groups don't sponsor me and bring me in and things like this. Right. So I got to get the money from somewhere. Um, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay, we just posted a link again there. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right, and uh, check out the articles that we have here on the uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. We have a lot of videos archived here also. All right, okay. So be sure to read this. Be sure to read these articles uh, dealing with uh, the interview with Winston, Winston Marsalis, and listen to it as well. It's really, really good. All right. Okay. Remember at the African History Network. Uh, what's up with your website? What about it? Which website? Okay. And uh, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent. I'll check out the website. Okay. We may have to Put a different card on the uh, on the uh, uh, on the website. Okay, but you can still register for the online courses. Okay, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read and heard and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you control the circumference of his actions. Because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Um, right now it's correct for wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Everybody be sure to uh, attend an African Liberation Day. Uh, celebration in your area coming up uh, this weekend uh, is May 25th uh, and usually have uh, weekend celebrations okay for African Liberation Day uh, that celebrates the struggle that African nations went through to uh, gain their independence from the colonial powers okay African Liberation Day extremely extremely important if you wear green on say if you wear green on St. Patrick's Day would you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? If you wear green on St. Patrick's Day, will you wear red, black, and green on African Liberation Day? Okay? So that's that's the question you should ask yourself. Because a lot of African Americans celebrate uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day. I really don't know why. I don't even know if they understand what they're uh, uh, celebrating. Okay? And if you were green on St. Patrick's Day, we were red, black, and green on African Liberation Day. All right. So Jim said, not talking about Marvel's Black Panther, are you? Yeah, uh, that's the uh, presentation I'm doing. Uh, lessons from the film Black Panther, Economic Guerrilla Warfare, Political Self-Defense, and How to Wakanda the Vote. So I'll be doing that presentation at African Liberation Day. Uh, in Detroit at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. I speak on Saturday, May 26th at uh, 3.30 p.m. I'm doing a workshop. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ray Winbush, she's doing a workshop dealing with reparations uh, at 2.30 p.m. And I speak after him, okay? All right. Okay. All right, guys, we got to get out of here, okay? Talk to you all later. All right, peace.